exciting panel with us today. And um, instead of me going on and about on about how brilliant they are, uh, I'm going to. <laughs> yes, you are so brilliant. Thank you very much for attending. I love you. Okay. <laughs> so. so. Uh, I would like to first uh, ask uh, Mr. Alamir Morshed, uh, Executive Director and CEO, CEO of the Infrastructure Development Company Limited of Bangladesh to introduce himself, please. Good afternoon and uh, thank you to ADB for inviting me. So I represent a company called EatCall, which is the Infrastructure Development Company Limited. It's a state-owned company. I say it's a very unique company in the sense that it's owned by the government of Bangladesh. Uh, predominantly, uh, the single agenda that we have is to finance the private sector. So back in 1997, uh, when the government of Bangladesh realized that to meet the ambitious uh, infrastructure development program of the country, the public sector alone cannot do it. And therefore, the participation of the private sector uh, has been acknowledged. And we all understand, I think, which is very relevant to today's topic, is how do you finance the infrastructure development and how do you bring in the private sector in that uh, development uh, agenda? And obviously, how do you finance uh, those projects that the government of Bangladesh has prioritized? Now, over the years, we have just celebrated 26 years. And in the 26 years, what started as a company for investing in uh, infrastructure development evolved into a company which has started funding very interesting, very socio-economically impactful projects uh, in renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency, which we'll talk about during the course of this dis discussion. Uh, what I bring in very uniquely in this forum is uh, I have spent uh, almost uh, 27 years in a commercial bank, and therefore I understand what the commercial banks look at in their investment, and now I'm heading a company which is a development financial institution. So I understand how you know, we could merge these two sectors uh, to make uh, you know, the, the en entire agenda of uh, clean, uh, clean energy financing more impactful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I have to uh, go more into your compliments that uh, you have been with Standard Chartered Bank Bangladesh and you are a very, very respected and seasoned banker, respected in all of Bangladesh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So may I introduce Mr. Christoph mm -hmm. Napez from the uh, Electricity de Fonds. Uh, he is the director for Power Grids and R&D in Asia. Yeah. Thank you very much. So Christophe Napez, as uh, was just presented, I work for the French uh, National Electric Company, um, which, is, which employs about 160,000 people in France and around the world. Um, we're quite active in Asia, so we have um, some investment in uh, power plants, and we're now trying to develop grid interconnection projects as well. So I think uh, I can hopefully bring to this panel the utility point of view as an electric utility. And um, my role, my current role is to um, uh, develop innovation in power systems, so grids. Thank you. Uh, and uh, one of my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Naoki Sakai, CEO of D-Sharing, he is one of the success stories of people who have gone to bigger and better things after ADB. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Naoki Sakai, and uh, I see the old my friends. Uh, and uh, my, I started my career with Tokyo Electric Power Corporation, where I worked for corporate strategy and human resource management. Then year 2000, 23 years ago, I joined ADB, and I worked for Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. Particularly in India, I uh, developed a project, uh, totally taking the PPP approach uh, to install uh, 250 megawatt 
uh, solar power project in 2008. That was the world's uh, largest. Uh, mobilizing the concessional fund, which is called Climate Investment Fund. Then I uh, retired uh, from ADB in year 2016. It's seven years ago, and I created the, the startup for Climate Tech. And now I'm working with the Government of Japan, Minister of Environment, to promote uh, the distributed solar PV project. Uh, together with demand side uh, approach uh, using IoT and AI and this stuff. And I also working for promoting the EV daytime charging. Thank you. So, thank you. So I think we have a very good panel to, for this discussion. And let's just get started uh, with the premises of the deep dive. So. First, let's get on with the problems, okay? What are the issues uh, for adopting new technologies and innovative technologies for our DMCs? Uh, we always get the complaint that, you know, it's always the old, old stuff for the DMCs. What are we not getting in uh, bids for new stuff? You know, why are, why are we always one step behind and not leaping ahead? So. Uh, from our experience, uh, it has been the cost as well as the unfamiliarity of the countries with the new approaches and or regulatory hurdles. So we'd like to hear from uh, our panelists on what they think are the issues uh, and then uh, go on from there. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of... Uh, technology migration, I think one is the awareness of the technology. So I think that's where the technical people come into play. And very often, that this is my experience, I've been in this particular segment for last over a year, where I see that some of the uh, stakeholders who are involved in it, they come with very standard solutions, which may not be suitable for a country like say, Bangladesh, for many reasons. So I think one area is while the people with the technical know-how are trying to help us in the transition to clean energy, uh, I think that is one where, uh, you know, these technical people has to have more, better understanding of the geographies. I think that's one. And the second where we play, you know, is of our interest as a financing institution is obviously the access to uh, financing, uh, access to capital, whether it's debt or equity or quasi-equity. Uh, again, uh, you know, as I have mentioned that uh, Bangladesh, uh, if I just talk about my own country, is uh, vulnerable to climate change, and we all know uh, that there's a huge investment requirement uh, for both uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation. And uh, the government has taken very ambitious, uh, you know, uh, ambitious uh, targets uh, like by 2030, they want to have at least 10% of the energy mix into renewable energy, and by 2041, to 40%. Uh, and that's huge. And we're talking about billions of dollars. Uh, the government has a very clear plan that the uh, that 70, more than 70% of that financing has to come from private sector. And what we see, again, that uh, bringing my experience as a commercial banker and a development financial institution, I think the, the ma marriage of these two segments is very critical. Uh, while development partners we are supporting at the initial stage when there's a new technology, as I think you are alle alluring to, is, you know, sometimes the conventional financial institutions do not find it very attractive in terms of their return parameters. So I tell my commercial bank uh, colleagues, you know, you will see many of these multinational banks where, where I worked, uh, transition finance is a big agenda. You will see their group CEOs, you know, going into various forums and talking about various ideas about transition finance. But when you really look into their balance sheet, they're still not doing enough. And because their due diligence framework, uh, their return framework, is still very much driven by the shareholders' value. Uh, they are very much driven by the return on equity, or what they call it, the suboptimal return. So I think that is one part, a responsibility that I would put on the commercial players. Uh, on the other hand, as development partners, 
I think today I was just sharing with one of my colleagues that probably we need more network uh, networking uh, forums or platforms where the TFIs and the private you know private sector players could come together. Because otherwise, we're talking about two different tale of two cities, you know, talking about two different things. Uh, coming to the, uh, I think one was the, how do you bring in the development funds and the philanthropic funds and the commercial funds, the, the very classic uh, definition of blended finance. The first thing that I understand, at least from my market perspective, is the definition of blended finance. What we are struggling with in countries, emerging countries like Bangladesh is very often we see there's a lot of fund coming from overseas in foreign currency. Uh, we have a very shallow local currency market, whether you talk about the tenor of the loan, whether you talk about the risk appetite. Uh, I think you know just borrowing foreign currency is not the solution, especially in the long term. That has huge problem in terms of exchange risk. That has with the SOFR, with interest rate rise, we see a huge problem in managing the interest rate risk. The entire financial cost uh, for any entity borrowing foreign currency is not the solution. So the question is, how do you develop a very robust, vibrant local currency market? A and that requires many, many stakeholders. I very often tend to tell my you know, uh, development partners that thank you very much, you're bringing in a lot of foreign currency fund for us but help us to build the local currency market. And one way of doing that is non-funded risk participation. I think just giving cash is not good enough. I think you can help us if you really want to tap in private sector funding, then help these private entities to cover their credit risk and other political risks, et cetera, et cetera. So I have seen some discussion going around where there are talks about non-funded risk participation I had just met iTrust, I think is in this uh, conference today. I think more or more of these kinds of institutions who should come forward and help to cover the credit risk. Last but not the least, you know, uh, even if I pick an example of ADB, we are getting funds, you know, through the government. But as an entity, when I borrow that money, I have to be very careful that I have to return the money because ADB would want their money back on time. But when I'm on lending to an entity, I have to also ensure that I'm getting back that money and then I'm returning it to ADB. Now that is where the catch is. How do you really put your, you know, uh, 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 what I call your stake in the game? Just handing over the cash and making utilization of the cash is not good enough. So we need to have a, a mechanism where we can work together and help each other in covering the repayment risk as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a lot to uh, consider. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry, Christoph. You... Yeah, so if we look at it from the utility point of view, um, I think the utilities who, who will benefit from um, renewable energies and be operating them uh, probably or perhaps in public-private partnerships, they, their objective is to ensure reliable energy supply. That's, that's what they're there for. And these are the KPIs which they have to meet. <coughs> so I think when we're introducing uh, new technologies, um, it's important to have a holistic view, and it's important to be able to reassure the players, such as the utilities, but not only that the new technologies which, they're int which we're going to introduce are not disruptive to the operation of the electricity system. So this is, this is work to be done by the technical side. The technical side needs to have a holistic view of the system. But I think all the players, including the financial um, players that are intervening, it, whatever part of the blended finance they might be from, uh, it's good if they can have a holistic view uh, so, for example, if you're bringing in a new technology that generates electricity, it's good to be sure that you have the infrastructure behind, so the, the grid and so on, and the control centers that can absorb this energy wherever it is geographically, and that can manage these new energies um, as they come through. So I think that holistic view is very important. Uh, knowledge transfer, I think, is another issue 
we need to be sure that uh, the operators of these systems have a full, uh, you know, are fully trained to use them and to maintain them. And that's the way we're going to reassure the players in the system, including the finance side. Yes, thank you. I fully echo these two gentlemen's uh, points. Number one is how to uh, make a, some kind of a knowledge uh, platform to share all the information. And the second one is to uh, uh, support, uh, develop the infrastructure, particularly power sectors, power grid infrastructure to enable the new uh, system like a uh, distributed solar power generation system together with uh, decentralized uh, power storage system. So oh, actually uh, I have three uh, unique uh, exper experiences. Uh, number one is as a power utility and my second career is as an ADB officer uh, working in emerging uh, market including Bangladesh. And the second one I am now the CEO of the startup. And my market, my, my field is in Japan and also California, United States. And uh, let me focus on the one topic, uh, the technology transfer. So I went to uh, United States, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, there was some gathering where the nice, bright, young <laughs> 20 uh, CEO and CTO uh, in uh, California and they have a very good solution technology and i believe that should be you know adopted immediately to emerging uh, country market uh, particularly in bangladesh but they don't know there is a vast potential uh, exist in emerging uh, markets say so they tend to focus uh, their field only in the united states or maybe Europe or Japan. So somehow uh, we should develop any, some kind of a system where maybe ADB will play a central uh, role. Uh, the uh, DMCs, policy makers, financial institution can frankly uh, exchange the information and views together with uh, the startup in the Silicon Valley, in the Europe, in Japan and uh, in China, Korea, all this kind of the, you know, young and bright <laughs> mindset persons should participate in this kind of the knowledge platform. Thank you. Thank you for so many good ideas. So I'm not gonna try to answer all the questions from an ADB perspective, but just uh, for a couple of things that, I mean, I, I think I've never thought about changing the minds of uh, commercial to go from not an R ROE mindset. But one of the things that uh, we can do is to explain or to um, make fully transparent the risks of not going through the more greener or carbon neutral, um, what do you call it, operation. Because so that the risk, the full risk of uh, climate change and full risk of not decarbonizing is included in the calculations for ROE. So th that's one of the education things or that's one of the knowledge sharing things that we can do. And uh, on the network, on NDB's commercials, um, because it is, as you say, a tale of two cities. So we we'll have to do a much better job at engagement and I hope we can work together uh, to have that more open conversation in all of our countries. And the blended finance, uh, yes, risk participation, we do. We have a guarantee project. So, and then of it not being, um, a skin in our game would be a guarantee product that is not based on government counter guarantee. So we have a, that instrument, so we can be using that. But perhaps uh, the, the theory of blended finance and going through it here is to use blended finance as the backing for our guarantee so that we can provide guarantees cheaper to those innovative projects. And so th the um, 
I think those are the stakes in the games that we can do. I mean, I absolutely agree on the holistic, and I think we can talk a little bit more about uh, the electricity system and the grid. And uh, of course, as you're saying, knowledge transfer. Um, can I go to Silicon Valley with you next time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, that will be really fun to do. <laughs> okay. okay, who's going to volunteer for the Silicon Valley trip <laughs> here? <laughs> I think we should have one of those and the text I mean so we can uh, think about creating these platforms one of the platforms that we do have is ADV ventures where ADV invests in venture capital companies and we were had uh, invited a few of our investees here I don't know if they are if you are here raise your hand I guess not okay that didn't work. Okay, so, <laughs> but I'm hoping I'm hoping that we will have more of these uh, conversations. So, um, just talking on the on the what do you call it, new technologies. So, uh, Christoph and Sakai-san, could you go into like what are the practical new technologies and innovation, and what are the dreamy, you know, far out, exciting things from your perspective? So, Christoph first. Okay, so. I think in the relatively medium term, we're going to see more and more offshore uh, renewable energies, uh, floating solar, uh, which is not necessarily offshore. It could, it, it's on um, dams and, uh, and uh, lakes and so on. Uh, so the advantage of that is that uh, you, you don't use land. Also, being on water reduces the temperature. It's quite good for the photovoltaics. Um, I think that's going to develop. Um, then floating um, wind turbines as well is something that's that's coming up and that will develop thanks to technological advances. Also, probably marine energy will develop over the coming years. So you can use marine currents, you can use wave power, you can use tidal power as well. Um, this is good for a country like the Philippines, where there are so many islands. Another technology that's coming up over the medium term is hydrogen, with the use of hydrogen as a, not as a genera energy generation, but as a means of storage, storing energy and transporting energy. Although there are still a lot of questions about how financially viable that is going to be. Uh, there is quite a lot of energy loss when we do that. Uh, so making hydrogen and then using the hydrogen to make electricity. So I think these are the probably the, the, the emerging technologies which we're going to see in terms of renewables. Um, but there may be others uh, that we haven't seen yet uh, coming up. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. Um, but right now, everybody's using PV because it's, uh, the technology is getting very cheap and we're used to it and we know what happens, we know how to use it, um, but it does have some disadvantages. So, yeah. Yeah. And wind, obviously, uh, is being used a lot. So yeah, I don't know if you have any other. Yes, uh, please let me add uh, several other technologies. Uh, relatively low-hanging fruits is uh, like a flexible thin film, solar panels. I think it's already uh, commercialized in China and uh, other countries. And also on top of the floating solar, maybe we can also consider the small scale uh, floating offshore wind power turbine. And also uh, maybe com combination of the solar and uh, battery storage, I mean decentralized distributed system and the integration of that, uh, we call it a virtual power plant or resource aggregation. And I believe that in Germany, uh, the company called Zonen, so they are taking lead of this kind of business model. Already it's fully commercial. And uh, I know that the Bangladesh, uh, the EDCOL, uh, introduced solar home system. So on top of the solar home system, they can install the battery storage uh, to stabilize uh, and uh, uh, for nighttime uh, renewable energy uh, supply. So that kind of technology I can easily imagine. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so from the finance perspective, when you hear a list like this, any thoughts? <laughs> I think uh, in terms of finance, obviously, you know, companies like Eat Call, uh, what, they, what we do is we come first. We try to create a market so that the, you know, the private sector banks or financial institutions can come into the game. Uh, you know, in Bangladesh, if I could touch upon on some of the technologies we just spoke about, I think solar is, has been our main focus. And uh, problem is we don't have enough land. So, you know, and that creates a huge challenge for making solar really effective. But what we are doing is there's a lot of focus on the solar rooftop technology. Uh, so recently the government has been withdrawing subsidy and which has made these investments more commercially viable because of the tariff difference. Uh, so things which were like just a year back was more like push sell where we were trying to, you know, uh, motivate the, our clients to install solar rooftop. Today the good news is they are coming to us and they're really demanding finance to install solar rooftop. Uh, the other thing that we see is an indirect pressure from, you know, Bangladesh is a garments exporting country. So the global brands are now demanding that by certain, you know, uh, timeline, this garments factory has to convert to more renewable energy. Uh, so that is helping the entire value chain to go into renewable energy. Uh, clean cooking, I think, for countries uh, like uh, Bangladesh, uh, where we still use, you know, in the, in the rural community, some of the very conventional traditional cooking stoves, uh, which creates health hazard and uh, environmental issues. Uh, so we, are, we have a huge program on improved cooking stove. I think one thing I would again remind, while hydrogen and other, other such sophisticated technologies are important, but there are many very traditional basic uh, technologies uh, which can be really impactful and I think we should not shift our eyes from those kind of technologies where more developed economies can look into things like hydrogen. Uh, but for us it's more solar rooftop, biogas, ICS, you know there's a host of these very very basic uh, things we are talking about but which can make a huge difference uh, to the entire you know this clean green uh, energy uh, uh, journey. Um, so that is where we are. Uh, and again, uh, as I said, the more viable it becomes, we will see more incentives for the private sector to join hands. I have a question because you're talking about um, improved cooking stoves, and I think that's really important. And you, in terms of health impact, in terms of uh, so many ways, but how can a financial institution promote and encourage something which is basically in, in the home and that is on a private fam family level? Yeah, so the way it is being funded today is purely grant. Uh, so we are getting grant funds which we are deploying. Uh, but I think we can really make it work through the microfinance ecosystem. So if you say there's MFIs, you know that, again, coming to our example, in Bangladesh, microfinance had made a huge change in the socioeconomic development where we're empowering women and microfinance model can be used to, to fund uh, such projects as ICS and biogas because they are the same base of clients or end users who are using the ICS uh, as microfinance. So we are talking about how can we adopt the model of MFI into this kind of fund funding. So what private banks can do is they do not have the capacity to link to the rural community because you know they have a very limited kind of branch network, but they can make use of the MFIs who could on lend to the to the end users. Mm -hmm. So that can be a model because grant I don't think is the best way of doing it because there's a lot of misuse of grants 
and we have seen that that grants do not reach the the ultimate target group can i also ask can i also ask one question uh, so you rightly mentioned that if we just simply provide a grant to the household then that will create some kind of moral hazard issues and uh, I remember that uh, IDICO provided some kind of concessional financial scheme for solar home system 10 years ago. Uh, could you kind of elaborate the scheme and uh, how that is uh, the current situation? And uh, because of that, the, the so-called uh, uh, solar parity uh, is achieved or not? Uh, so that particular program is solar home system has been extremely successful. Uh, where there was an element of grant, element of debt, and element of equity. Uh, the challenge was, uh, you know, these were all offered in the off-grid location, and we had installed almost uh, 6 million solar home system, generating almost 200 megawatt of power. That's huge. And to the rural community, it had a huge socioeconomic impact because the rural economy just, you know, saw a huge growth, outburst of growth, because the solar home system with the storage facility was, uh, was keeping the economy uh, up and running even when it was dark. So I think that had a huge impact. But as Bangladesh achieved 100% uh, uh, grid uh, coverage last year, obviously the, the demand for solar home system gradually died down. Uh, but coming back to the same structure we are doing is on the solar irrigation pump. Again, a very important project, SIP, because uh, in countries like Bangladesh, we use a lot of diesel-generated motors, which pollutes the environment, which, is, which consumes a huge amount of foreign currency in terms of importing diesel. And these are very inefficient motors. So the solar irrigation pump, what we do, again, there's an element of grant the element of uh, debt and equity. Otherwise, these are not viable. Uh, the trick is you need to find a good borrower. Yes. Unless you do a proper due diligence, and if you just keep in your mind that I have to increase numbers, that is a disaster. So we have to increase the numbers, but through right borrowers and the, through the right operators. I think that's where the trick is. Thank you. Um, Christoph, I wanted to ask, I mean, since Bangladesh has received, re uh, achieved 100% grid um, connectivity, so it, when these, um, well, what call the renewable dispersed systems come onto the grid, I mean, w they can sell it to the grid, I mean, w what kind of investment should be done? Because, I mean, that's one of the things that perhaps as we go on to like over 30% renewable energy, perhaps that's where we should have our blended finance go in to make it possible for these renewable energies to come in. Hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. In fact, I was asking myself, you know, when you said Bangladesh has reached 100% grid penetration. Um, well, two things. Firstly, is that does that include really everybody, or is it just the the main towns or the main villages? That's that would be one question. And another question would be, what happens to the solar home systems when that happens? But before I let you answer that, just to answer the the question, um, so a solar home system with a battery uh, isn't made for grid connection. So if you, if you have the grid arriving into the, the village or, you know, wherever, then I think probably what happens, but, you know, is that people just discard the solar home system and connect themselves to the grid, which is a bit of a shame. If you want to connect the solar home system to the grid, you need an inverter, which is grid connected, um, which is an electronic device that you need to buy. It's quite expensive. Um, so that is perhaps one, uh, let's say, lead that we could give to, to the, the financial institutions is to say, well, why don't you encourage uh, the families that now find themselves close to the grid or potentially connected to the grid 
to install inverters with their solar home systems. Uh, they need to recycle the batteries. They don't need the batteries anymore, so the batteries can be recuperated and recycled. Um, and they need also uh, a meter that can uh, go both ways. So a meter that can allow them to buy electricity, but also to sell electricity. So I think this can be nice for them. It's a good, uh, you know, it could be even be a source of revenue <laughs> in some cases, but um, it's, it's a lot of work. So you need to finance all this, you need to explain it, you need to go in the villages, you need to install the inverters and so on. So yeah, what do you think about that? I mean, have you, have you seen cases where people have managed to use the solar home systems or do they just throw them away or do they sell them? to uh, Bhutan? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's all about economics, you know, economic value. So uh, if I have uh, electricity uh, from the grid and it costs me $11, $11 or cents, and if I have uh, alternate source of energy, which is like $0.08, cents, it's no brain and I will take the $0.08. Cents. So I can have two sources, but I will use which is cheaper. So what's happening now is uh, even for the commercial use. So the, as you mentioned uh, the, at your concluding remark, that the net metering policy helps. So where you have, you know, both solar, uh, renewable, and you have the grid. So I will use the renewable if it is cost effective. So what we have seen in countries like Bangladesh or India where subsidy is, the government provides that. Uh, in various sectors now, it has been made very clear because of various issues, the government is reducing the subsidy, and probably at one point, the, the energy price will be adjusted to the market. And that is when, you know, all these industries will be making more use of the solar uh, rooftop uh, technologies they are connected to. So now we see that economic value is, is, is making sense. There is a differential. So that is how this is used. Uh, and more and more we see, uh, you know, because countries like Bangladesh and Net are importer of fuel, the HFO or LPG or the gas. Um, so I think that uses a lot of foreign exchange, and solar is kind of free in that sense. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works, net metering and feed-in tariff. Thank you. So net metering and feed-in tariff. But, um, First off, I think th the other question was the stability of the grid when a lot of uh, renewable energy comes in. So should uh, MDBs be helping on that front to encourage further encroaches of uh, innovation in renewable energy? So that's a, sorry, it's a Christopher's yeah. <laughs> question. I think. Okay, so your question is um, if, if the photovoltaics, for example, is grid connected, what happens to the grid? Is your question, yeah. So that's a good question because um, most grids are built to, to, for energy to go from a central point or several central points outwards or downwards to distribution level. So when you have a lot of photovoltaics, for example, coming onto the grid, it can be difficult for the grid to deal with that. Uh, in particular, the protection systems that are in the substations uh, find it difficult to, to deal with that. And also the control centers that um, manage the, the flow of energy within the grid are not usually designed to deal with that. So it would be good um, in that situation to um, encourage a modernization of the control centers, modernization of the protection systems which are in the substations. Uh, so it, it's not that expensive, a control center, a national control center can be modernized for 20 million euros. Uh, and with a modern system, you can then, um, you can then m better manage, better analyze all the information that's coming up from the grid and better manage all these small systems that could be, you know, bringing in, tr troubling, let's say, the stability of the system. And in fact, it's, they really should do that because there could be blackouts because you have paradoxically too much energy coming at the same time from, let's say, downstream to upstream. So, yes. Sorry, and then uh, I'll let you. Oh, can I ask one question uh, regarding uh, uh, that? Uh, so, Christoph says that it's not so uh, rocket science technology 
and it's not so expensive. But uh, having said that, uh, let's say in the case of Bangladesh, uh, there are two distribution company, DESA and DESCO still? No? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> there is a distribution company, and uh, uh, given the, their uh, very, uh, how to say, limited uh, resource mobilization capacity, uh, they have to make uh, additional investment, as uh, Christoph says, that uh, like a uh, SCADA system or power flow controllers and <laughs> frequency voltage and that kind of stuff should be installed in the distribution line itself. So the point is the who will shoulder that kind of expense. And uh, my question to ADB is that uh, maybe Kawaki-san, you can mobilize some kind of the concessional fund to support distribution company to make that kind of not big, tiny investment. Thank you. Um, do we have Priyanta in the room, who is the <laughs> head of the sector group <laughs> for energy? <laughs> um, I, I think we do have those uh, kind of projects. I mean, of course, if there are state-owned uh, distribution companies, that will be on a government level. But also, um, I think we can do with non-sovereign financing. Uh, and to and encourage that investment uh, through the distribution companies that are, well, uh, more private. Yeah. So we can do that if we try, okay. So um, I have a lot more questions, but I'm just wondering if there are any questions from the floor. Oh, okay. Um, who's, who's got the mic? Okay. The thank you, down, thank you. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ram Dital from Nepal. I just would like thank you very much, by the way, for the detail, you know, uh, uh, deliberations. My question is: We are supporting 635 megawatt uh, storage hydro projects, right? We're building uh, one of the biggest projects in Nepal. I'm just wondering whether we could introduce the concept of floating solar there. What are the what are the challenges? How do we leverage the finance? I like the word blended finance, but in the context of Nepal, you know, uh, even though we are entitled to get subsidy, you know, the soft loan or non uh, sovereign loan, but still, you know, because of the credit, uh, credit uh, you know, rating issues and other, you know, com compliance related issues, uh, no one actually wants to invest in a huge way. So, what is your suggestions? How do you actually, uh, you know, mm, uh, suggest I am, how do we? you know, work in this area where we could actually get access to the, you know, blended finance, as well as introduce the, the floating solar in the, you know, on the big reservoir that we are planning to build. Thank you. So from the technical side, Christophe, you want to? Yeah, I think um, putting um, floating solar on a dam, a hydropower plant, is a very good idea because you have a hybrid system and you can benefit from a certain stability uh, in generation, which is always interesting to have. You, um, there are a few minor technical challenges, but it's it's you know it's it's surmountable for, for that kind of project. And one thing which you could look into, I'm not sure if the, this includes in blended finance, but. When you do that, you can generate renewable energy certificates or RECs. And uh, we, we had, um, so my company EDF has a hydropower plant in Laos, uh, on which, which is a one gigawatt uh, hydropower plant, which we're, we're thinking of putting some floating solar actually on this uh, project, on this plant, a dam, sorry. Um, and I think you know that the way the business plan is looking today, we, if we if we can um, um, generate renewable energy certificates and resell them in the marketplace in perhaps other countries outside of Laos, uh, that could that could contribute to the viability of the project. So I would encourage you to look into that. There is a renewable energy certificate market kind of emerging. Um, in, in Singapore, in uh, you know countries that have 
uh, very little renewable energy potential, Japan, I think, uh, Korea. Um, and the price of these renewable energy certificates is still fairly low, but it's kind of going up with energy transition. So I don't know if that comes into blended finance, you know, perhaps uh, I don't have the right definitions. But, you know. So yeah, I would encourage you to look into that. And don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. <laughs> so, Sakai san? Yes, uh, let me add one thing. Uh, maybe on top of the concessional financing, we should also consider some kind of risk sharing or risk guarantee system. So without that, uh, any, you know, Nepal, domestic, small, private sector cannot make uh, that kind of big decision. And the second one is that, uh, you know, this kind of technology is not rocket science technology. So it's relatively easy to install that. But it's quite challenging to operation and maintenance. So that kind, maybe EDF or, you know, the expert and knowledge uh, is available. So capacity development program or knowledge sharing program is, again, very important. Thank you. And I think ADB can play a role <laughs> in that. In fact, you do. Thank you. So on the finance side or on the uh, invitation or trying to get in more private sector to be interested in projects of this nature, uh, we have lots of instruments, especially for uh, Nepal, uh, which I think everyone loves. <laughs> We've heard so many uh, good stories about experiences there. On floating solar, uh, what we can do is, if it is uh, bid out to the private sector, uh, there could be a offtake guarantee so that the private sector is sure that they will get their money. And it could be uh, I, I wouldn't, th the after guarantee that we did, for instance, for like the country, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, when they were just starting out their PPPs in uh, solar, uh, was a very short period. It was only for, I mean, it's three months guarantee for each pa payment. And there is a cure period. And because that guarantee was not only backed by the sovereign, but it was backed by ADB, uh, there were a lot of, of investors interested. For Nepal's case, it may be a longer period, but that's something we can add on to increase the confidence. And uh, exactly what was being said, I mean, the operation and maintenance part is really the part that you want to make sure that you have the right partner. So that could also be uh, a big help in delivering what you actually wanted. and. Uh, ADB has a uh, transaction advisory services that can help you with all that as well. <laughs> so uh, in Bangladesh, again, we have a lot of ponds and a lot of rivers. So we have just financed one floating. Uh, so the experience we get is either you can do CAPEX or the OPEX model. Um, it depends whether you want to do it through an operator or you, you want to directly to a capex through the borrower. What is important is obviously selection of the operator. Uh, if it is a large scale project and if the off taker is government, the PPA structure is very secure and you have escrow account and you can really, you know, ring fence the cash flow. So when the government is the off taker and if it is under a PPA, then the, the, the security issues become much less important. The problem is when there are two private sector parties, the buyer and the seller. That is where the PPAs may not be good enough, and that is where the payment guarantees uh, from, uh, you know, ADB or triple rated entities become very important. But I think you're 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 referring to large scale projects. the government but still because of the huge you know cost uh, at the same time uh, you know the project is being you know developed by a government owned subsidiary company 
So Yenye is this uh, state-owned utility, and they have formed a subsidiary company, special purpose vehicle. So the, so, the, so the whole idea is to how can we make this project bankable? Bankable, of course, project is definitely bankable. Otherwise, you're not going to give us money. But in this, in the, in, you know, if the cost, since this is a storage project, the tariff will be a bit high. So idea is to actually, you know, initiate, install floating solar there. And then uh, Yenye will definitely be, you know, buying the power for 25 years, right? The off-taking issue is not there. Uh, the cost is a little bit high. So that's why, you know, maybe after this meeting, I will introduce my colleague who will be managing the project, uh, Bimalzi. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a separate discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Um, over here. Yes, the kind gentleman who laughs at my jokes. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Paul Faith. I'm uh, the Director for Climate and Energy at APT Associates. We implement programs for US, AID, FCDO, Australian government and others. Um, my, my, what I've been struggling with is innovation within development organizations to do blended finance for technical innovation. And what I'm specifically referring to is I've been working on a put together a public-private partnership to electrify 10,000 health facilities in Africa last year. We're looking to do the same in Asia, but the conversation that I keep having over and over again is, well, we have a health program over here, and they're responsible for running health facilities. And then we have climate and energy people over here, and they say, well, the health people have all the money so, you know, they need to provide the blended finance part of it to do these guarantees. And the health people say, well, this, that's an energy problem, so go talk to the energy people. And I've, I've seen it over and over again where these two separate programs and they don't talk. And I, I would bet that there's not many health people uh, here today. I don't know if there are, but at AC, you know, it's an energy thing, right? So why would a health person show up? So what I've been struggling with is how do you, you know, make these happen when you're doing a, what's in the development organization structure in every development organization I have so far spoken with. These are separate programs that really don't communicate. And, and that has been it. So if you have any ideas <laughs> on uh, resolving that, uh, I'd, be, I'd be really interested how to make those kind of sectors, you know, talk. Um, so this is just a ADB thing, so I don't know sure. if it applies to anyone else, but uh, since we've had this uh, new operating model, and one of the tenants, or the biggest thing is that we are a climate bank. So everything we breathe, <laughs> eat, see, has to have climate in it. And uh, whether it's a health project uh, or an education project, whatever it is, we'll, the question will be asked, what are you doing for climate? Whether we're creating a school and we have to say there's an adaptation element, or whether uh, we're doing the school project in Uzbekistan. Uh, and I asked that question to <laughs> you know, our colleague here, Amir, saying, what are you gonna do about climate? And if he tells me that there's gonna be a rooftop you know, uh, solar, uh, so that some of the energy could be at least renewable, and especially for the schools that are way out in the uh, rural area where electricity is not reliant, I'll say, okay, yes, and where are you going to get the money? And he'll say, I'm going to get it from a grant in the energy group because I've talked to them already, and we'll say, hurrah, and if he doesn't, then I'll say, like, okay, not good. <laughs> So that's the kind of mentality that ADB is now going under. So if you find that with us, let me know because I'll go talk to the sector director uh, that has given you the answer because we're not supposed to be in those siloed mentalities anymore. Okay, any other questions? Okay. I'll, the mic will deliver itself. Thank you so much. <laughs> delivering the mics. Oh. Yeah, first of all, thank you all the panelists for this elaboration. Uh, my question is on like, um, probably it's a bit different than the title itself. Uh, we talk uh, talking about the blended finance in clean energy innovation, but I've heard that ITCOL has a good experience in energy efficiency 
and like would be nice if you the panelists could share a bit your experience on uh, promoting energy efficiency through blended finance thank you yeah so uh, you see a major part of power is being consumed by the industrial sector and therefore energy promoting energy efficiency has been a key agenda for us and we get for our funding we get support from the development partners but what we are trying to do is we are co-financing so while we put our money on the table we are not solely doing it we have the capacity of doing it we can go out and you know lend to one of the large local group who is extremely credible and we have the capacity to lend to that particular uh, name but what we would encourage is we will bring other private sector into the co-financing. So that solves one problem where you have private sector lenders who are willing to come and invest in the same project. Uh, and that's in a way we are sharing the risk. And at the same time, we are trying to meet their agenda of you know, clean energy. To, to, to a great extent. That's how we are doing, whether it is syndication, whether it's through a bond, uh, that's how we are playing a role of an arranger or a manager. That, that's our way of, of managing it. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. The ladies, I mean, we haven't had ladies, so please, <laughs> can we have ladies' voices, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandel. I'm with uh, the World Resources Institute. I'm based in Vietnam. So I have a question for Bangladesh case. Uh, this is really impressive uh, progress you made. Uh, so you mentioned Bangladesh uh, has like net metering and feed tariff as a, a, a subsidized a kind of mechanism in, uh, for private sector. I wonder if you can elaborate more, if any other mechanism to help those uh, companies like you know global brands who has uh, multiple supply chain across uh, Bangladesh where they have a, a very ambitious goal to go to 100% renewables or uh, sign based targets as such so because mm -hmm. we have the same things in, in Vietnam you know the, the global brands have a lot of uh, demands for that but uh, so far, we are not able to <laughs> meet that demand. It's a, it's a challenge. So I wonder if uh, uh, how Bangladesh is doing with that. Any other innovative uh, mechani mechanism to support uh, those? Uh, thank you. In Bangladesh, where the global brands are pushing for it, you know, for their supply chain, for most of the for the many of the large exporters or the suppliers of those commodity is fairly easy. So for maybe, you know, if there are 5,000 factories producing garments, maybe for the top 20%, it's very easy. But the challenge is, as you go down the chain, that is where the trouble is. So the discussion is how do you support those companies to convert or transition to, to clean energy? So you know, if I was a multinational entity, probably I could have banked on the buyers through a supply credit kind of a structure. But that's not happening. So we are also thinking that how could you support the middle market and the SMEs? And that is where, you know, you have to have more credit appetite. And at the same time, that's great to have, but we don't want to come to a situation where we do not have recovery and we have a huge non-performing loan. So it's a bit tricky, but there is also support from the central bank where they're providing fund. One thing I think we all miss is there are two kinds of risk here. One is the liquidity, which may be funded by the central bank or development partners, but where is the mitigant for the credit risk? I think many of the specialized banks in our markets have lost a lot of money trying to support agriculture, for example, because these were very specialized agriculture banks, but they had money, lent money and they could never recover, and they had huge erosion of capital. So we don't want to end up in that situation. So to answer your question easy, for the top 20, who are the major exporters, so it solves the problem to a large extent, but the bottom ones are where the problem is. 
where I think we need to be more innovative in the financing structuring. Okay, so from just adding on, uh, from the MDB side, we, if the government wants to support those, uh, well, they're not actually SMEs, but <laughs> there's they're the more medium companies, right? Uh, in this export area, they could ask for support in, um, well, looking at the risks, as well as, um, you know, how to apply for the loans, as well as if it is required, uh, you know, the, uh, the, gar well, the guarantees or the first loss funds uh, through, let's say, a, a transition first loss fund uh, that you can get through uh, concessional funding. So those are things that, you know, you may want to, you know, that we can do to help. Okay, any other questions, answers? Okay, uh, I think we'll keep on with the ladies. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Tanya Roberts-Davis. I'm with the NGO Forum on ADB. Um, and I, although I'm based here, I have colleagues in Bangladesh, so I was interested in also um, asking a question from th about the Bangladesh case, um, and especially, specifically because we know even from IDCAL's website that IDCAL does, um, has supported and, and continues to support several gas power projects. So our question in this context is then, in terms of your suggestions around covering political risk, covering um, risk factors of a project, and transition finance, is your, when you're speaking about that, to clarify, are you also speaking about the gas power projects? And the reason I'm also asking about this is because one of which it call supported in the past, uh, the BOLA IPP, was also supported by the AIIB um, and now has, is being supported by IFC MEGA, but um, has uh, grievance cases against it for the issues around land grabbing and other um, problems cr created by the project itself. So just curious about when you're speaking about transition finance, whether this is what you also are including. Um, and then a second question actually in relation to the hydropower project in Laos, I assume it may be Namton too, but um, just wondering, and uh, I also have a background of working with groups on, on hydropower issues uh, faced by communities, including in the Mekong region, and um, having seen the impacts of people being displaced um, by large-scale hydropower projects, uh, just curious whether when you're speaking about placing um, floating solar on, on the reservoirs, whether then um, in terms of the overall project conceptualization, you're also taking into account the concerns of communities that use the reservoir now um, and rely upon it for fishing, for example, but that in fact by putting on um, solar panels, there is a concern, including in not just in Laos, but in other, in other countries, what that could mean for um, causing problems within the community in terms of sharing resources, access to water, access to fish, um, and and the rest of like the natural resources around the the area, especially if it's built up. So just wondering if that um, comes into consideration. Uh, I know it's not the technical issues here, but it it, it certainly does come into the, the overall arch overarching picture when we're talking about a just transition. Thank you. Sorry, not really on blended finance, but if you'd like to answer. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, as I have mentioned in my opening remarks, that ITCOL was formed in 1997 when Bangladesh had real shortage of power. There was a huge problem. And since we had gas, um, you know, we did fund a lot of these IPPs, which are predominantly gas-driven. And uh, we had almost single mandate to do is invest in power projects because that was the, uh, you know, demand of that point in time. Uh, but over the years, we have kind of, the, we have moved from there as Bangladesh has already achieved considerable, uh, you know, uh, self-sufficiency uh, in power uh, through the HFO and other, you know, fossil fuel. 
Um, so now our portfolio is we're diversifying to the renewable energy. As I've said, our key projects is now a solar rooftop, uh, grid tied uh, solar, uh, and ICS is a huge program that we're running, uh, biogas, so, and energy efficiency. So the entire focus has changed, uh, but environment uh, compliance is one of our key agents criteria because we get funds from the development partners. They have very stringent uh, environmental compliance issues. And again, it brings us a lot of challenge in terms of multiple development partners will have different standards. So we are also trying to you know, kind of combi com combine those into one standard format. So there's no way we can really avoid uh, the compliance standards in terms of environmental issues from the development partners because we are fully funded by the development partners. I hope that answers your concerns. Thank you. Yeah, so the question on um, floating solar. Um, so floating solar has a number of challenges. There are some technical ones, but also non-technical one, which ones which you mentioned. In fact, there's another one as well, which is that um, they can have an impact on the uh, fish and the algae that live in the lake. So you need to look at that. You need to look at the impact that that has. If there are people using the lake for fishing, um, which could be the case in Namtum, I'm not that familiar with the project itself, um, then that needs to be taken into account. And it probably means several things. Firstly, you need to limit the surface area uh, proportionally to the size of the lake. And secondly, you need to engage with the local population um, to ensure that you know, you, you're explaining what you're doing and dialoguing with them so that the impact can be minimized. But uh, I guess any human activity has some impact, so you just have to um, be sure that all the players are involved and that there's a discussion as to how to minimize that impact. But it's a good, yeah, it's a good point. So we're a big fans of floating solar, and uh, we've done a lot of studies now. And uh, there are ways of actually increasing the fish through the platforms that are there and creating habitats. So this is where it's a win-win. And of course, we talked, I mean, if it's a project supported by ADB, we talk to the affected people, trying to have that conversation on how it's going to be a plus for them. If it's not, then where, you know, the locations. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I think with that right conversation, it could be a net plus for the community. And uh, yeah, I hope we have lots more of them. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, riches. Um, okay, mic person. And <laughs> I think right there, maybe is <laughs> closest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just looking at women. I <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Nancy Nguyen. I'm from Asia Clean Energy, Energy Partners, a private company, uh, a firm in Bangkok. So um, I heard from the panelists uh, talking about the, the role of the government, the role of commercial bank, the role of uh, MDBs, uh, such as ADB, in the uh, ecosystem to promote planted finance. So I'm wondering, um, maybe you could comment on what role that philanthropy or philanthropic organization can act or can be involved in this ecosystem to promote planted finance. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, again, it's a very broad definition, philanthropic fund. For example, impact fund, I presume it's kind of a philanthropic fund. Uh, one challenge I see in case of impact fund, uh, they invest in projects which are economically viable because it's a saying that they, again, at the end of the day, they have to have a certain rate of return for the investors. So while that sounds philanthropic, but when they are look, talking about returns, my experience has been it's a very commercially driven return, no compromise on return. So I think that creates a bit of an issue. 
because in blended finance we cannot deny the fact that we are investing in projects which still not really commercially viable. So pricing is an issue. And that is where you need concessional lending or pricing. Um, so that is one way I think the philanthropic fund can play a role by looking at projects, giving it a shelf life for a certain period, and then probably demanding the right pricing. So if, um, what we've asked for the philanthropic funds, like uh, we're going and pitching to the Gates Foundation and everyone to say, because of this area of um, getting innovation and getting higher technologies to clean energy projects, you know, give us the money <laughs> so we can invest more in these projects and have more of these projects come in. So when we asked, um, you know, if you had a grant for $10 million, you know, what would you add on to this project to make it more efficient, uh, more uh, friendly, more sustainable? Uh, we're hoping that we'll be getting the philanthropic funds as well as the, con the funds from the countries, the donors. Thank you. Okay, who else? Okay. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Kanin from Donia Group. We are a German consultancy engineering firm. And um, first of all, thank you very much for the valuable insights and experience. Um, we are lucky enough to actually support ADB, OPPP in various solar projects, including floating PV and the project in Uzbekistan. So I can definitely vouch for the transaction advisory that Kawasaki Sang earlier mentioned. But uh, my question today would refer to Sakai Sang. Uh, regarding you, because I think I cannot get my trip financed to Silicon Valley. So just clean to know your low-hanging fruit technologies that you said that could be applied to some emerging markets. Uh, we'll be very interested to know about some of those if you may share them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, okay. Uh, there were several uh, uh, how to say the technology uh, for example the you know utilization of the blockchain and uh, as you mentioned about the credit certificate uh, I mean uh, and uh, you know uh, normally the, this kind of uh, uh, I mean the offset credit certification is quite uh, common and commodity and anonymous but using the NFT or using the blockchain, you know, people can identify or differentiate the quality of the renewable energy. You know, uh, maybe one uh, solar PV could harm the environment or communities, I mean, social uh, impact. But on the other hand, uh, like a rooftop uh, PV is uh, less harmful in terms of the environment and the social. So uh, there is some kind of activity to uh, certificate uh, using NFT to ensure that uh, the renewable energy uh, in the quality uh, of the renewable energy is really ensured uh, by uh, blockchain uh, recording system. So that is number one. And second one is uh, utilization of the AI. You know, in order to estimate, uh, the gentleman talk, uh, talk, talked about energy efficiency. So uh, let me introduce uh, uh, some technology in Silicon Valley. Uh, maybe Google, Nest, uh, some other technology they are using is that uh, using AI, they can forecast the uh, volume of the consumption at some day. And uh, they can set some kind of baseline and if somebody can reduce the, their energy consumption, and the AI can calculate exactly how, how much uh, consumption is uh, reduced, then they will give some uh, reward. Uh, so that kind of AI uh, utilization is another aspect. aspect. Thank you. Thank you. I think we still had some questions. Um, anyone else? Okay. Ah, okay. Lady over there. Yes. Uh, I don't know why. My eye just goes to the ladies. 
Good afternoon. My name is Gloria Tirado. I am from the academy, and I'm here just to, uh, you know, ask questions about financing because uh, I, I was just looking at the uh, uh, small scale financing, for example, in the uh, barrio or in the uh, small uh, localities. We're in. Uh, I remember. I remember that an algae can be a source of renewable energy. If uh, I, I don't know if, if uh, you happen to have a, a project on that so that you can, you know, uh, I have heard a while ago that there's a problem getting the support of the locals. But if, if these locals can, can uh, have this some sort of ownership in a particular project, perhaps uh, we can also uh, include them to this uh, blended finance uh, principle. Uh, that, that's uh, th that's my one point, and I, I want just to know if you do have a project like that before, even to the ADB. Okay, um, I'm not affair aware of any algae projects. No, I'm sorry, but uh, in involving the communities on small scale, uh, I think you know what you have mentioned, sir, with the community um, off-grid solar or off-grid um, with solar with battery. I think there has been a lot of consultation on getting their buy-in, and then, uh, like, well, um, I tear up when I say the word Afghanistan, but <laughs> in Afghanistan, you know, we were looking at having those uh, solar powered uh, systems, you know, go into like having a little bit of cash generation through charging of phones, you know, like that would get people really interested in actually having these systems and then also the maintenance, doing it on with the local people. So it's not, well, we didn't do that on a blended finance basis. We did it on a major just a grant or, a loan basis, but those are things that we've done. Okay. Um, okay. Any other, any other questions? Okay. And my learned colleague, Mr. Sohal Hosni. Yay. Hi, good, afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I, Cleo and I used to, I was part of the ADB. I retired or graduated after 22 years. I just want to have a question on the two words, basically, unlocking and innovation. I have done few ADBs first. I think I did the first solar project in Mongolia 2002. I did energy efficiency in the Philippines 2007 or 8 and failed miserably by trying to do the first electric vehicle project. But one thing that I have learned had been that when I presented a slide in the Philippine NEDA board that government will save $300 million, somebody later on told me, you know, I'm going to lose that $300 million business. How much money I will throw to stop you? So I think the point here is, will any of those blended finance go towards managing stakeholders? making sure the incumbent's interest, the lobby group's interests are managed, because we cannot write those things in our RRPs, but those are the realities that happen. That how do you actually make sure through our procurement, uh, if we want to do in the Philippines, say, a bus project, electric bus on EDSA, there are hundreds of concessioners who are there. How do you bring them in through our procurement process so that they are on this side, not on the other side. Because I think if we look at unlocking innovation without the uh, finance side of it, I think that's where the challenge is. Because they are, they are out there. The climate deniers are out there. I'm part of now within Australia, electric vehicle group. You won't believe the type of sort of interesting stories that people bring into the discussion. Unrelated, but still, it sort of creates confusion, others who are not involved. So I think that's my question to the panelists. 
how do you address that? How do you manage stakeholders when they are trying to do innovation for the first time? Thank you. Thank you. Very difficult question. So, uh, Sakai-san. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Sohail Hasuni, my great teacher, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's quite important to involve the uh, stakeholder, particularly they can complain about uh, the procurement system as well as the project justification. Hmm. So, my team will host a workshop this coming Friday at 9 a.m., particularly here, you know. I hope you can join and let's discuss. I will bring some uh, special case about mass system in Brunei and crack, as well as I bring some kind of project involving the uh, Japanese consumers. So thank you very much. Please join. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so it ended up being a setup for a commercial. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think we have w one last question, if there's one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Chris. Could I just add that this issue which you bring up is a, a big issue for energy transition because if you close coal-fired power stations in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, then it's not just an economic or a technology issue. It's a social issue as well. And lots of people stand to lose their jobs or lose their source of income and so on when you do that. So I think it's a big issue, and I know ADB is, is you know, looking into that. It's, um, but it's a huge issue for energy transition, so we really need to be sure that all those people who might lose their jobs can find jobs in, in renewable energies and so on. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's a just transition mechanism. Uh, we have a portion that is for support for retraining uh, exactly those people. And uh, having that, those communities that are affected really involved in the consultations on how we go forward. So, okay, so six minutes left. One last question. Who's going to be the finale host? Okay. Oh, there's, okay, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gina Herrera from the French Development Agency Philippines office. Um, from a financial institution's point of view, I, I think my, my question is just, um, uh, I know that coming from the new operations methodology framework of ADB, you are open to partnerships of all uh, stakeholders, whether it be philanthropic institution, other financial institution, private sector. Um, is there a target or a policy in terms of figures? Like for every dollar of ADB financing mobilized through policy-based lending or through investment lending, um, say five cents of technical assistance grants will be uh, projected to be mobilized through partners or through other private um, institutions. Um, I, I just ask this in terms of um, perhaps uh, j just to understand more what would be the uh, in, in the medium term or in the short term, what would be the uh, the policy of uh, ADB in terms of uh, mobilizing other partners for this, for, for climate financing? Thank you. Yes, so absolutely. Um, we don't have a target number because that would be too scary if we can't meet it. Uh, but we have this 100 billion number for our direct financing. And uh, my hope, you know, just me, you know, little old Cleo, so hope is that we will have a multiplying effect of that money. And um, well, if any donors are listening, uh, our office has for every dollar, $27 of investment from private sector. So your $1 becomes 27 in if you um, co-finance with us. So uh, if AD, AFD wants to partner with us, we'd be more than glad to have that discussion. Okay, so um, gosh, we have, do we, do we have one more or should, should we, any last words, sirs? Or any, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, you want? Yes. Oh, please. You're fine. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, 
I know, but he, he's one of my guys, so, you know, he's, he's, oh, yeah, well, he is handsome, but, you know, <laughs> okay, uh, anyone, I think we saw a hand in the back, no, okay, well, if any last words that you want to say, because I, I won't be able to wrap this up, so I just wondered, no, okay, okay, uh, Please let me introduce one uh, very interesting story. So this gentleman, Mr. Sohera Hassani, introduced a very uh, innovative uh, electric uh, vehicle project. And uh, taking that uh, uh, legacy, uh, the Zen mob, Mr. Tanaka, uh, made a POC in Intramuros. Uh, they organized uh, they, some test run uh, supported by Japanese NEDO. And uh, one uh, single mother, I mean one mother uh, uh, with a small baby, she paid 20 peso uh, for the light, you know. Normally the, the fare is 10 peso for a uh, normal uh, jeepney. And she said that uh, she, uh, she was, uh, she is willing to pay that for conserving, conserving the environment, the knocks and the socks issue. So the, the, that, that kind of the goodwill should be, how to say, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, incorporatized to the project development. Uh, so what do you think about Mr. Soher Hassani? Uh, so that kind of the uh, citizens' uh, uh, goodwill should be incorporated uh, for project uh, development. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. I'm not going to wrap up, <laughs> but I'd like to say thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very rich discussion, uh, so much better than what I had thought might happen with me being you know, flat on my face, but it's, it's all due to the great uh, panels we had. And thank you very much uh, for staying here all throughout, and uh, I hope that uh, this added to some thought for your uh, further uh, consideration of blended finance and unlocking innovation. Thank you very much.